this is um, a lesion right here. We've got a, a nodule in the skin. It's relatively circumscribed, uh, centered in the dermis. And uh, you can see even from low power that it's got clear or pale areas, and then also darker blue uh, areas kind of around the, the periphery and also um, in, in little centered islands here. And here's uh, the second piece. There's some cystic change as well. So in DermPath, of course, we always want to start on low magnification. That's true of all pathology, but especially DermPath because you really get an idea of what the shape of the lesion is that you're looking at. Um, okay, so let's, let's go back to this then, all right? So again, from low power here, we've got a lobular neoplasm that's clear and pale in many areas, blue in other areas, and then it's got some cystic spaces. Focally looks like it connects the epidermis and has some, um, some ulceration maybe. And when we go closer, you can see that it's a clear cell or pale cell uh, neoplasm. It's got clear or pale uh, cytoplasm. Um, in the skin, there are a variety of things that can cause clear cell change. Uh, one of the big ones that people always think of is metastatic renal cell carcinoma, and that's always a good thing to keep in mind. But you have to remember that there are other clear cell things and mistaking um, uh, metastatic renal cell with uh, other clear cell tumors can be a real problem. I've actually seen that happen before where something was called metastatic renal cell, it did have clear cells. Then when they scanned the person, the kidneys were normal. So then they sent the case in consult and it ended up being a clear cell hydradenoma actually, which was great news for the patient, but obviously pretty scary um, in the meantime while they were worried that they were gonna be dying from stage four renal cell carcinoma. So this is not renal cell carcinoma, all right? The, the key here is that we can see the cytoplasm is not just pale. A lot of things in pathology we call clear cell, but what we really mean is pale, light pink, you know, we, we are kind of loose with the term clear. But these are truly optically clear, right? We have white spaces that are empty. They are, they are washed out during processing and staining. And when we see white spaces and that, that are nice and perfectly circular and that push in and indent on a nucleus, we know that that means that those were bubbles of lipid. They were, they were spherical lipid globules that during processing and then um, the H&E staining process, the lipid washed out and it left an artifactual hole in the cell. So when we see that in epithelial cells, usually we have to think of sebacytes or sebaceous differentiation. When we see that in mesenchymal cells, we think of lipoblasts, right? Those are both cells that have lipid vacuoles in their cytoplasm. Um, the difference, I mean, if you're a med student or a beginner watching this, the difference is if you see a sarcoma or a sheet, uh, you know, a, a mesenchymal tumor that has scattered cells with vacuoles, then you think of lipoblasts. But here we've got cells with round nuclei that are arranged into nests or lobules. So this is going to be an epithelial tumor. And um, that's how we know that the cells that we're dealing with here are not lipoblasts, but instead they're actually sebacytes. So there's no question at all when you look at this, anyone can say, oh, this is definitely sebaceous differentiation. They really, really look very much like um, the, the sebacytes that we see in normal sebaceous glands. Well, I mean, their, their nuclei are a little different, but the, the vacuolation is the same. And then also what we can see around the outside is we've got a lot of these blue cells. So let's take a closer look at those. The blue cells are, well, the, site, the uh, scan is not quite as clear right there. The blue cells are round, they're pretty uniform in size, they're hyperchromatic, they have punctate nucleoli in the center, okay? Um, you might look at those and say, well, that's kind of atypical, but these are basically analogous to the germinative cells, the basaloid cells that line the outer layer of a normal sebaceous gland. And if you look around, you'll often find uh, mitoses in these cells, even in benign sebaceous tumors, because sebaceous, those cells, their normal job is to divide and grow, right? So they're analogous to the germinative cells of the sebaceous gland, and those cells are normally actively dividing cells. So in this case, we've got a circumscribed tumor. It uh, has relatively uniform basaloid cells, does not have severe atypia or pleomorphism does not have invasive growth into the dermis, and we've got obvious sebaceous differentiation. So what we're dealing with here is a sebaceous adenoma, okay? So sebaceous adenomas are benign sebaceous neoplasms, and sometimes they're sporadic. Um, in fact, I would say in my practice, probably most of the cases I see are, sp are sporadic, but also in some patients, they can occur, occur in the context of Muratori syndrome. And Muratori syndrome is just a fancy name, basically, or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer syndrome, or HNPCC, plus sebaceous neoplasm. So if you have HNPCC and then sebaceous tumors of the skin, that's called Muratori syndrome. Um, so the reason this is important, actually, is that 
in patients, um, in certain settings, when patients have sebaceous neoplasms, it may be worth working them up and seeing if they have Muratori syndrome. All right, so the, um, the, uh, this is, there's no doubt telling that this is sebaceous here, um, and this is a pretty good example. And most of the cells are sebaceous with only a smaller population of the blue basaloid cells. So that's when, when we see that, that's when we call it sebaceous adenoma, okay? Cystic spaces can sometimes be seen, and from what I understand, the cystic spaces in a sebaceous adenoma actually are an even stronger indication that the tumor is probably associated with Muratori syndrome. So usually when I diagnose these, I have a little comment that says sebaceous neoplasms are sometimes associated with Muratori syndrome. The question that often comes up is what do we do about this? Do we do microsatellite instability testing, the, um, the PMS and um, all the microsatellite and stable proteins? You can if you want, but those tests are not totally perfect. They can be lost sometimes sporadically in sporadic sebaceous tumors um, and not necessarily indicative of germline. So usually I leave it into the hands of my dermatologist to decide what they want to do. If they request me to do microsatellite instability testing, I'm happy to do it. Um, sometimes they send the patients for genetic counseling. Sometimes they'll send the patient for a colonoscopy. Sometimes the patient's 85 years old and probably there's no need to do that further workup. So I, that's why I leave it open-ended because the dermatologist often has a better idea of what the clinical setting is for the patient and whether or not more testing is needed. So here's a sebaceous adenoma with cystic change.